I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. It's especially <coughs> uh, good for me because my daughter lives in Singapore, and I get to see my daughter when I come here. Today, I want to talk about a more serious topic. It's eCPR and how, how, making, how we end up making a great team to do it. I have no conflict of interest related to this topic. <coughs> it's well known that prolonged episode of conventional CPR is associated with poor outcome. So we need to have some other ways to help these patients. And one of them may be ECMO or eCPR. But ECMO is related with its increased cost and resources. And it's also uh, has associated with uh, many complications also with the procedure. Uh, this is the, one of the early uh, uh, famous studies on eCPR. It was from Taiwan. And in their ex three year experience between 2004 and 2006, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, they uh, compared eCPR with conventional CPR by pro propensity analysis. And when they did that, as you can see from, oh, so, sorry, this graph here, the red one is the patient who received eCPR, uh, and the blue one is the conventional CPR. You can see the uh, uh, significant survival difference. Uh, we did a similar analysis uh, of our, our patients, and our patients uh, were from 2003 to 2009, and we also had a, just a, a, a simple analysis and propensity match, matched analysis. As you can see, the patient who received C eCPR had a significant better survival compared to patients who were treated with just conventional C CPR in the old patient group and also in propensity score matched group. And this uh, survival benefit seems to last a long time and we followed those patients for uh, two years and the uh, survival benefit uh, persisted after those two years. So to to have uh, optimal outcome on eCPR, there are uh, several decision makings that you need to handle. You need to uh, you need to uh, settle settle with, within your group uh, beforehand. So you have to have a very a, a concise uh, indications and contraindications, a way to activate the ECMO team and make complex decisions among, among your uh, CPR team, ECMO team, and primary service. Also, you have to be proficient at insertion of the, these catheters under such uh, uh, stressful conditions. And also, you need to have a, a system where, you, where the patient would receive the best post-eCPR care. So, so patient selection is, uh, I think, the most important factor in the success of eCPR. Uh, the degree of ischemic damage to be uh, taken into condition was, was the uh, arrest witness. Did he receive bystander CPR at the site? What, is, what is, do you think is the cause of arrest? If it's a single arrest, especially associated with ischemic cardiac disease, maybe the patient will do fine. But if he arrested having multiple uh, organ failure and multiple systemic trauma in an old age patient, he might not benefit from eCPR. So this, these are the indications that we use in our uh, institution. The indication is of eCPR is a persistent cardiopulmonary arrest despite conventional CPR for 10 minutes. It has to be witness arrest and uh, presume reversible cause of cardiac arrest. The con contraindications are uh, uh, here. Uh, it's here. So, but those, uh, those, these factors are associated with uh, 
a poor prognosis in this patient, even if we uh, successfully insert catheter and, and then turn the machine on. But it's not always that uh, easy, uh, clear-cut decision, because the patient might have collapsed during some procedure or operation, and the primary care doctors want him alive. Maybe the patient is a family of a hospital employee. Maybe a senior professor who do not understand about ECMO wants the procedure done. Though those are uh, in a hierarchical society like Korea and maybe in Singapore. Those are the uh, challenges that we face when we are trying to decide whether to put the patient on eCPR. But what does the guideline say? Uh, the American Heart Association guideline says that eCPR is no routine use, but in the settings where it can be applied rapidly, uh, you, you may consider it in selected patients. In, for example, uh, a patient who has a potential reversible cause, age under 75, and no return of spontaneous circulation after 10 minutes of conventional CPR. Uh, but the uh, CPR duration has a real uh, prognostic effect on the long-term prognosis of eCPR patients. This is a study done by the same Taiwan group that was published in uh, Critical Care Medicine in 2008. Uh, the x-axis is the duration of CPR before they had uh, the machine on, and on the y-axis is the mortality of probability of, of patient survival. As you can see, if you if you can have the machine turned on within 10, 30 minutes of uh, starting CPR, the patient survival will be around 50 percent. But but when this uh, uh, time lag uh, goes to 60 minutes, the survival uh, drops to around half of what it was. And we did a similar analysis with our patients and. These, were, these patients were, uh, 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 we, we analyzed 152 patients in whom uh, 48 survived the discharge, and we tried to look for prognostic factors of patients who were on eCPR, and uh, developed a, a prognostic model. And in, in, the, in our analysis, age was a very significant factor, and also, uh, Purseless electric activity or uh, shockable uh, ventral fibrillation and uh, pulseless VT was also good prognostic factor. And time from CPR to ECMO uh, turn on of less than 38 minutes was also a very, pro very uh, big factor in our, uh, our people. And the uh, initial pulse pressure and also initial SOFA score of less than 14 was also associated with improved outcome. And when you, we did a, a ROC curve, it came out very a predictive of a, a good survival, improved survival. And patients who had a, a 10, more than 10 of a, or eCPR score had much, uh, much improved prognosis compared to who had less than 10 in our eCPR score. Uh, this is a, uh, it's, a um, it's not yet published, but it will be published this year in anatomic surgery. And this, uh, this uh, relationship between time and prognosis uh, seemed to be uh, complicated by age of the patient. So in, in young patient, here, uh, in, in patients who had a, a CPR pump on time of less than 30 minutes, they, the, they, the uh, also of, uh, also of urologic out, good urologic, poor urological outcome was uh, very low, whether they were a young patient or old patient. But 
In patients who, who had a, a CPR to ECMO pump on time more than 30 minutes, the age had a significant effect. As, uh, as a, a patient over 60, uh, the, the uh, incidence of poor neurologic outcome seems to go up, and it, it, it had an exponential uh, uh, upward swing as the patient got older. So uh, if the patient is more than 60 or 70, uh, you should really consider uh, time as a very essential, essential part of, of what you are trying to achieve in your patients. So in our uh, center, we try to achieve less than 30 minutes of pump on time. So uh, ten, about 10 minutes of CPR, 10 minutes of preparer, and 10 minutes for cannulation and pom pom. So, uh, so you should, if you are trying to develop this, you should have an institutional guideline. And if it's an uh, intracardiac cardiac arrest with cardiac disease, check for contraindications and go. Go for it. If it's an out of hospital cardiac arrest without medical information, you should consider many factors before you, you uh, decide to do eCPR. And discussion between the CPR leader and ECMO team on call is very, very essential. So I will uh, briefly touch on eCPR procedure. This uh, patient was a 60-year-old uh, old patient with a his past history of uh, hypertension and type 2 diabetes, and he suddenly collapsed and came to our, our, our ER for, for management. And after 10 minutes of uh, conventional CPR, he did not arrow SSC. So we decided to uh, go on to eCPR. And this is the, uh, after we cannulated the patient, we took an X-ray. And can you see something wrong with this? So the cannula is in the AO. This is supposed to be a, the, the venous cannula, but it's in the aorta. So we had to take it out and reinsert it, and now it's in the proper position. So it's uh, uh, compared to conventional ECMO insertion, uh, the catheter insertion under stressful condition of CPR is very, very, very difficult. So there's no gold standard. You should have, uh, uh, you should have ways to uh, cannulate uh, according to the resources that you have. Uh, in, our, in, our, in our hospital, we have two pathways. One is the cardiologist would do it in the cath room through fluoroscopic, and one, the thoracic surgeon uh, on call will be doing the cannulation when they are not in the cath room, so usually in the percutaneous way. And also, it's very important to, to have a ready-to-use ECMO unit that you can uh, use at any time, because you, know, you never know when a CPR event will, will happen. So there's a blind percutaneous way. Uh, you may do it under fluoroscopy. Uh, ultrasound can be used, but uh, if you are not very experienced in these procedures, it's very, may, may be difficult. And a surgical cut-down technique is sometimes used when we cannot do it percutaneously in a stressful condition. And another thing is that uh, CPR should um, just because you have your cornelian, do not stop CPR un until you have confirmed the proper position of your catheters. That's a very, very important point. And uh, for optimal outcome in these patients, post-ECPR care is also very important. So uh, after you all cannulate and the pump is on, you should assess and correct for uh, uh, the cause of the uh, arrest. Uh, routinely, we, we use brain CT, uh, coronary angiography, maybe echo. And if he has a risk factor for uh, massive pulmonary embolism, 
we, we may do a CT for pulmonary embolism. And uh, it, you should have your uh, plans for moving this patient safely. So uh, general care with sedation and stabilization and cannula site should be uh, stabilized. And uh, if electric supply so that you, the patient is not uh, endangered by sudden, uh, sudden stoppage of the machine. The post-PR care is also uh, very important, including targeted temperature management. And this we published in PLUS One about the, uh, about the uh, target for temperature management after uh, ECPR in, cardiology, in our cardiology uh, unit. As you can see, uh, the, the red, 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 <laughs> red group is patient with normothermia without any, uh, any uh, methods applied to uh, decrease temperature. And the, the middle group is the actively controlled fever group, which we uh, actively controlled fever in these patients because they had a uh, fever. And the third group is the unattended hypothermia group, where we saw uh, patients uh, with a temperature less than 35, even, even if we did not did, did anything to control their fever. And what we saw is that uh, the two groups in the two upper groups, the normothermia group and actively controlled fever group, had similar prognosis, while the patients who had uh, hypothermia which was unintended, had the, the worst prognosis. So we may think it's a sign of a neurologic damage when these patients have this uh, uh, low temperature. Also, we are also looking into uh, early signs of uh, neurologic prognosis. And this is one of, the, one of the papers that we published in Critical Care in 2017, which looked at uh, the features of uh, the of the early brain CT of ECPR patients and their uh, final neurologic prognosis. And when you combine these features, uh, uh, basal ganglia, uh, gray-white ratio, optic nerve sheath diameter, and the loss of boundary, uh, the, when you combine these features together, uh, they, are, they are more predictive of uh, poor neurologic uh, prognosis. Uh, compared to just, one of, well, well, just uh, each one of the factors uh, that, uh, that, you, that we can see here. Also, uh, uh, post, as a post-care, uh, 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 prevention and management of complications of ECP uh, ECMO is very important, as with other uh, uh, ECMOs. So corneal site bleeding, limb ischemia, LV distension should be managed according to, to uh, uh, you should be monitor for these uh, common complications and manage them as uh, uh, quickly as possible. So this is perfusion. Uh, we routinely do septal puncture. When we, when we do put in, insert the ECMO uh, in, the ca uh, in, in the catheter, ca catheter room. Uh, also look for Harlequin syndrome, uh, thrombosis, uh, hemolysis, and all these complications should be managed as, as uh, quickly as possible for optimal outcome in these patients. And, this, uh, and when the patients have recovered and we are trying to uh, uh, wean them and finally uh, can get the catheter out. We are using the uh, percutaneous method of uh, uh, arterial uh, closure, and uh, we think this is technique is much uh, is easier to apply, and it's very very effective. And we compared our per per uh, percutaneous method versus surgical removal method, and we saw that. Uh, uh, the success rate was similar, around 85%, but the procedure duration was much less with the percutaneous method compared to surgical method. So 
if you are if you don't if you are not using this kind of method, you should consider it in your um, uh, center. And, and let's I'll briefly talk about our ECPR program of, of SMC. Uh, before we had an ECMO team, the ECPR was not organized. There was no specified coordinator, and there was no sense cons shared consensus on the indication of ECPR. So there was a random contact by e CPR leader to thoracic surgeons or cardiologists, and they would do it randomly. So there was no systematic management uh, of equipment and uh, that, is, that is needed for ECMO. That, that, and it was very uh, uh, haphazard way of doing things. So we established an ECMO team and we established a consensus on indications. And like I alluded before, we had two pathways in the cath room. The cardiologist would place a line on the floor spirit guide or, ear on, or or when the patient collapses in the ER on the, on the ward floor, CPR team leader calls thoracic surgical team, uh, a team, team for uh, placement of the catheter. And we organized the management of ECMO machines and supplies, and uh, it's supported by ECMO coordinator on weekdays and on-call professionals on weekends. So these were the indications. So we have, we always have at least one machine ready to use uh, in, in our uh, institution. And all the supplies are right next to uh, the, uh, the machine, right here, right here. So when there's a CPR and, and the patient does not ROSC in 10 minutes, and it's thought to be a reversible cause of arrest, and, she, and he doesn't have a, a factors also with poor outcome, the, the CPR leader will call the senior thoracic surgeon on call, and the surgeon will, will contact our ECMO attending to discuss about the case. And if it's a go, he will start cannulation. And ICU nurse trained in ECMO or ECMO coordinator performs on site will help in the, in, in the process. Now we're currently doing around 50 uh, ECPRs cases per year. And uh, 2013 was when we started uh, our center. And I, our formal ECMO team started in 2014. So as, the, as our experience and as our uh, method of uh, flow uh, was established and uh, as our experience grew, you can see a big increase in uh, winning success of our e-ECMO patients, and also uh, survival discharge. And about 80% have a good neurologic outcome of our uh, survivors. Uh, this is my last slide. To avoid, I think it's very important to have a team approach. And this team will involve everyone who's involved in care of CPR patients. And this is our ECMO team. This is me. I'm a, a pulmonologist, and he's a cardiologist. He's a thoracic surgeon, another uh, pulmonology intensivist, and she's our, she's our ECMO coordinator. And some of you might recognize him. He's, uh, he's from Singapore. He spent one year with us at our center, uh, learning about ECMO and uh, uh, interventional oncology. Thank you for listening. <laughs>